Fantastic. It's 10 a.m. We're ready to go. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Um, I am going to just go through some housekeeping rules here, and then I'll introduce Javier Molina, and he was from our Kateer team that's going to uh, be sharing with you today a presentation. It, would you be able to put it on presentation mode, the presentation, and I'll... Definitely. Okay. Thanks so much. Um, next slide, please. Fantastic. So if you're not part of our community already, we invite you to join us for free. Um, we have our developer portal, developer at developer.zebra.com. Um, and we you can find out all the information about our upcoming dev talks, dev buzz, our newsletter, and then of course follow us on social. We would love to follow you as well. So please do that. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things and upcoming events. First, I'll start with the upcoming events. We are going to have our second annual Zebra Dev Talks Community Day on May 19th. It's an all day event. You can come on and leave as you please or for whatever interests you and we'd love to have you the whole day if you'd like to come. Um, but we'll be sending out information in the next week or so regarding this event. And basically what we'll do is we'll have an all day, all online event and we'll have about, I think we're up to about 10 or 12 talks from our various Zebra teams and Zebra experts. So we encourage you to join us um, and it'll be all things developer and we'll be talking about a lot of product things as well for you. Um, so I highly encourage you to take a look. If you go on our developer portal at developer zebra.com there is a post about it and we'll be updating that as the schedule um, is updated as well with the speakers and then we are keeping our fingers crossed that this year we will somehow some way see each other in person um, and so we're planning this for November 2021 this year an actual live in-person event in Madrid Spain um, it's going to be about two or three days at the beginning of November. You'll be hearing more information in the coming month or so about this event, but it's really a great place for us to connect with each other, learn. We're going to be building, um, and it's all things for Zebra developers and a great networking event for you as well, um, especially with a lot of our Zebra experts. Um, so just a quick housekeeping rule before Javier takes over and presents this awesome topic on our ID Android APIs. Um, what we'll do is if there's any questions, I will ask you to please post those in the question, the Q&A box. And then at the end of the presentation, the team can address some of those questions. Um, if something comes up later on, um, you can always email us at developer at zebra.com. And I will pass those out to the appropriate team members that can respond to you uh, fairly quickly, a good turnaround on that. So um, with that, I am going to turn over to you, Mr. Molina. Thank you so much for our Katir team for being here. We really appreciate that. Thank you for the introduction. Is my sound okay? You sound great. Perfect. Awesome. So thanks. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor for me to be here. Um, I'm not a Zebran, uh, even though I have some some stripes here. <laughs> um, I'm part of Kutin Mobility, and we are one of the um, ISV part. Um, our partnership with Zebra dates back to the days before Zebra even acquired um, Motorola. We were already partners with Motorola, and we were focusing on um, essentially enterprise level and professional services around software. Um, our focus is software. Um, if we have to deal with hardware. We work with hardware through our, our partners. We are an ISV only, a software only ISV. Uh, we've got people um, essentially all over the planet. Um, and we got a few accolades uh, from Zebra. In 2015, we, go, we won the um, ISV of the year from um, 2000 other candidates. And in 2017, we won the Tablet App of the Year award for our Tech Dispatch product. Um, so we built um, dozens of apps using barcodes, RFID, which is the topic today, uh, QR codes, um, everything under the sun, um, for several rugged and non-rugged devices. And um, 
it's not just software that we do. Um, our partnership is larger than that. Um, and that's partly why we're here today um, in this presentation. So we have been helping with the with answering questions in the developer portal. We are members of the Partner Advisory Council, early adopters of all um, Zebra Android devices. Whenever there's a new device that's going to be put in the market, we get an advanced unit and test it uh, and validate of our software on it. And we're also early adopters of the Savannah platform. For um, We have used some of the APIs there and we're planning on using some, some more. Um, in addition to that, we have also helped uh, place people in the MotionWorks Enterprise um, division with the location services team. These are some of the customers we have worked with in partnership. Um, as you can see, some of them are very well known. And these are some of our um, off-the-shelf, ready-to-go products. Uh, tech Dispatch for field service order, or work order management, proof of delivery for um, chain of custody, Asset360 for asset management, Inventory360 for warehouse and inventory management, and Monit360, which we use to integrate sensor-based and uh, Internet of Things. So if you want to get in touch, you've got our details. And now um, let's start with the technical topic of today's presentation. So we're going to talk about RFID specifically in the context of Zebra Android devices under APIs. So if you have not yet, not yet worked with RFID or not worked with RFID with Zebra's devices, um, this is for you. So RFID is modern technology. It's, it's like pure magic. And it is technology, but it's also magic. So it's so advanced and it's so incredible that for the purpose of this conversation, we can consider it magic. And we'll, we're going to be using some, some magic spells to use it. So the way this works is you have a RFID reader. In this, in this case, I have this one here. This is an NC3300R, and the R stands for RFID. And it's got this built-in RFID reader. Then um, this reader is going to send some magic energy waves to a tag. And the tag is a small little thing here. This is a, this is a no-name brand. Uh, Tag. This is a sticker that you peel and attach to something, and it's got this large antenna. And thanks to this antenna, the tag can capture some of the energy that the uh, reader is sending, and then using that energy, it can send back a message to the reader. This is passive RFID. This tag has no battery. It's got no power other than what it can um, receive from the reader. That's similar to how you would communicate with someone by shining a mirror, then covering it and uncovering it to send different messages. The tag uses the energy from the reader and reflects back only part of that energy. And the reader sense, can sense that and then measure that and interpret that as useful data for us. Um, so RFID is like a barcode on steroids. So with the barcode, pretty much the only thing you can do is read the barcode. There's nothing else to do. With the tag, you can do quite a few more things. Uh, once a tag has uh, a code, you can still change it. So tag is reusable. You can write something else on it. Like if you had a mutable barcode, this would be it. And it's um, rewritable multiple times, not just once. Uh, but not, not only that, you can not only store a small code, like with a barcode, um, the tags can optionally have an additional memory bank called the user memory bank, which is available for you to use in your own applications. So you can write additional data to the tag and it will be readable later. Once you have written to a tag, you can also lock it to make it read only. You can even password protect the tag so that only the people with the uh, with the password can read it back. So it's safer than a barcode. And there are a few more things that you can do that we can um, talk about later, later during this talk. 
So in terms of um, technical uh, development, uh, you need the right SDK. There are two SDKs available, depending on which kind of device you're going to be working with. If you're working with um, the mobile computer like we are going to do here today, you need the one on the left, that's the one for Android or Xamarin. And if you're going to be working with a fixed RFID reader, which is the one I'm showing on the right, that has something else uh, that's called the reader host SDK. And it works similarly, but not exactly the same. The one you want for Android is this one here. So this is the specific URL for the Android um, RFID SDK. You can go there, download it, um, and then you'll have something like this. You get the library itself, you get the Java doc, and the sample application. So now let's roll up our sleeves and let's uh, start working with, with this library and with this SDK. So I'm going to go to Android Studio here, and I'm going to start a new project just to show how to start using the SDK. So we create a new application. Uh, the documentation on the SDK is going to tell you that you do need the Android support, the legacy Android support libraries. Um, that appears not to be the case anymore. So this application is going to work even if, if you don't include this. Once we create the project, then we can go and file new. new module, and we can import an archive. We can go wherever we unzipped our SDK and select this. We add the library, and then we need to add it as a dependency. So we can go here in our application script, Gradle script, And add it here. So I pay three underscore live release two oh one thirty four. Looks good. Let's save that. Let's synchronize. And now we're ready to start using the APIs. Okay. So we'll leave that aside for a second, and we're going to work with this other application that is already built. Um, the way this application is going to work is, first of all, we're going to connect to the reader. So nothing special here in the onCreate, although we'll, we'll see why later. In our resume, we have some code to connect to the reader. And you can um, add this, this link, you can add this uh, connection you can do that in on resume and then disconnect in on pause, or you can do it on, in on create and then disconnect in on destroy. There is a difference, um, and, different, and the difference is important. If you do it in on create, then you're taking the reader, the reader for yourself, and you're not releasing it when you when the user changes to a different application. So if that happens, now the reader is. Um, essentially locked to your application. No other application on the device will be able to use the reader. So um, think about whether your users are going to have to alternate between different applications. And if that is the case, you probably want to use on resume and you probably want to um, release the reader in on pause. The code for actually connecting to the reader is relatively simple. Um, th the thing is, if you see the other um, sample applications, they're going to have much more code than this um, because they're changing some of the settings. But for basic use, for getting started, this is the bare minimum you need, and this is enough. So the way you do that is you instantiate uh, this readers class, and here you select whether you're interested in working with a um, serial reader or a Bluetooth reader or, or both. 
there are constants for all readers, Bluetooth or serial. In this case, um, the built-in reader is considered serial. So that's uh, the one that we're going to be working with in this demo. Then you query this, um, this instance for how many readers there are available on the device, because there could be more than one. Assuming that you do get back a, a non-empty response, you can pick one. In this case, we're, um, we're working with just one, so we get the default and simply connect to it. Um, this can work or this can fail. If it fails, it will throw um, one of these that shall not be named. But assuming that everything was, goes well, uh, then you can start configuring how you want the connection to the reader to behave. So first of all, we want to tell the reader where we want uh, we want to be notified of any um, events that happen. And in this case, we are uh, sending these notifications to our own application and that uh, to our own activity. And that is because we implemented this interface, which will give us two methods that we, that we will see shortly. Then we're saying that we are interested in being notified whenever the trigger button is pressed, for example. That's uh, something that handheld event controls. But there, there are more things. We'll see those later. The most important for us and for the purpose of this demonstration is just the trigger. And we also want that when whenever we get a, a notification that a tag has been read, um, we want to get the information from the tag in that same call. And we'll change this later as well. But for, for getting started, this is the bare minimum. Uh, no, sorry, that, that's here. So this is where we ask the reader to give us the, uh, the tag information. Here we're saying we are interested in knowing where a tag, when a tag is, is read, is found by the reader. And finally, we are configuring how we want the reader to, to start actually reading. In this case, uh, this immediate constant uh, means that we will take control of that. We will invoke the, um, the start or the perform, rather, the perform method on the reader and the stop method. And we will control, we will programmatically control how this, this works. Then we tell the reader, well, we configured this trigger information. This is what we want. And we're done. This is just our UI message here. So with that, we are already connected to the reader. Next thing we can do is cast our first, first spell, uh, Inventarium Scanians, aka Scanning Attack, which is going to be quite easy. Let's fold this away. And let's show this interface. So this event read notify, this is part of the RFID events listener interface. This is going to be called whenever something of interest happens on the handheld. And there are quite a few things that can happen. But in this case, sorry, I'm yeah, even status notify is the one that's uh, that's called when something interesting happens. In this case, the trigger event means the user pressed the trigger button, either the actual trigger button or this one here. And then if what happens is that actually that the user did press the button as opposed to the user released the button. So here we're dealing with the press. We're going to do a few things. We'll update our UI and we, we will start scanning. So this method, this perform method on the inventory under actions on the reader, this is what starts the actual RFID scanning. And the thing with this is um, you will find if you're trying to do this live on your computer with um, with your reader connected through USB. While the reader is charging, while the device is charging, you will not be able to use the RFID reader. So you have to connect through Wi-Fi. So run these on your machine, 
and tell ADB that you want to use TCP IP instead of USB on port 5555, and then find the IP address of your scanner and connect to it. Once you do that, you'll be able to still use your device and develop with it, but you it will not be charging, so it will work. Now, the way to cast this, this magic RFID spell is you get your reader, you aim at the tag with faith, and you cast Inventarium Scaniamus, and you press the trigger. There we go. There are multiple tags here around, so we found two of them. Let me put this one away. All right, let's scan the other one. That's the one we want. Okay, so now we know we are able to scan tag. What else can we do with it? Well, next thing we can do is scanning multiple tags, which we already saw, um, even if by accident, but we'll do it again. We put, let's say, we have a bunch of tags lying around. And we go back to our application and run the scanner again. Sometimes you get one, sometimes you get another. Uh, that's because it's not deterministic, but that's fine. The idea is we are getting um, all the information from tags and even some additional information that we can see in a second. So it's, uh, as you can see, it's the same code and we are aiming in the same general direction of the tags, but unlike a barcode, which would only give us back one callback, we're getting multiple. Now, beyond scanning, um, so we got back one code, which is the AAAA or the E28, whatever. Um, we, at the beginning, we talked about some more information that could be stored in the tag. So let's see how we can read that. All right. We have a read all memory banks function in here. And this is what the memory layout looks like for an RFID tag. Um, these are not to scale, but there's a reserved bank at the start. There's an EPC bank, which would be essentially the equivalent of, the, of a barcode if we were dealing with barcodes. Then there's the tag ID, which is um, an ID that the manufacturer sets at the factory and is typically locked. You cannot change this. And then there's the user memory. And both the EPC bank and the user memory are available for us if we want to write to them. The reserved bank is a bit special. It's also writable, but this is where the access password and the kill password are stored. The access password is going to prevent anyone else who doesn't have the password from reading the tag or writing to it. And the kill password will allow you to tell the tag never to respond again. So it essentially kills the tag. The way you read um, the information is we're going to go, in this case, we're going to go through all the four banks and we invoke this read bank function. If you want to see the details of that, we need to create an instance of this tag access operation and then set the read access parameters to say that, well, we're, what we want to do is read. We could also write, but in this case, we are just reading. We say which memory bank we want to use. This comes from this constant here that we're um, getting. And now we say, well, reader, actions, tag access, read, wait and wait means um, synchronous so we uh, this method is going to block until we get back a response we want to read this specific tag id and we want the read operation to be performed with this information that we set here and in case of readers with multiple antennas you can even specify that you want um, some some um, some specific parameters for the antennas, but in this case, we don't care. And what this gives us is once you scan a tag, we 
we're going to be printing it to standard out, and we can see the information here. So you can see, for example, in this case, the user bank is quite large. So um, depending on the tag manufacturer and on, on the tag model, um, this user bank can be user bank can either be absent or it could have something between 512 bits, even up to four or eight k of information, which is quite a bit. The reserved bank in this case is going to be empty, and if we had written a an access pass, password, we could still read it. So there's a a misconception in the RFID world that simply setting a password is enough to to protect the information of the tag. That's only true if the reserve bank is also locked for reading afterwards. If you don't do that, people will be able to read your tags because they will be able to read the reserve bank. The tag ID bank that we mentioned, uh, this is something that the manufacturer sets. We cannot typically change this. And the user bank is available for us. And the EPC bank is also available. There's something um, special about the EPC bank. Um, in the um, application here, we see that our code started with E28. So if we look at the EPC bank for E28, it's here. Let me make the font a bit bigger. Okay. So we got this, which is what we were expecting when we write the bank, but there's some additional information before. And that's because the first two words in an RFID tag in the EPC bank, they're special. Um, so the code that you get is going to be after the second word. So starting on the third, but we'll, we'll see that in a moment. Just keep in mind that these two words are special and words are composed of two bytes each, 16 bits. So we already read the memory banks. Now we can write the tag. So let's see how we can do that. For writing, we have, we need to enable something here. We're going to add, make visible a button. And we have a little bit of code down here. All right. So let's run this. There we go. Okay, so now we can, first of all, let's scan a tag and we get this AAA tag. That's our beloved AAA tag. We have this and we're going to alternate between writing this value that we already have and this other value. This is much more magical. You may recognize these numbers as, as being more magical. Seven is a very magical number. Nine and three quarters is a magical number. Five, nine, seven, two, you get the idea. So the way we do that is we create a tag access operation again, but this time instead of reading, we're going to say we want to write something. So we instantiate that as well. We set the password to zero because the, there's no password set. We're going to write to the EBC memory bank. So we're going to change the code on the tag. We want to say that um, this is six words long. And this is necessary, unfortunately. Uh, you do have to specify your um, the length of data you're trying to write. And then you have to set where in the bank you want to write it. So you don't necessarily have to write the whole bank. But in this case, we're going to do, to do so. Um, but we're going to skip the first two words like we saw before. Um, if you don't do this, if you try to write the EPC bank without skipping the first two words, the operation will fail. And it will fail with a CRC error because 
part of the first two words contain contains a, a CRC code for the rest of the bank. So if you don't specify that, things won't work. Now we decide what we want to write to the tag. And so if we, the tag that we saw was the AA, we write the other one. And here's where we specify which data we're going to write. And just for safety, we want to retry a few times. Um, remember that this is radio operations. So if you moved the reader very quickly or the tag moved away quickly while you were trying to read or write to it, things can fail. So it's always good to have some, some safety here. And finally, we will cast our Scriptura Digitalis spell uh, by invoking this actions, tag access, write wait. And remember, wait in this case means synchronous. So we're going to wait until we get back the result. And we'll write to the last tag that we saw with the parameters that we specified. And in this case, we don't care about the antenna and we don't need to provide any, any additional information there. If everything goes well and no exception is thrown, we'll go here. We'll see that the tag has been written and we'll hear the magic sounds. So let's try to do that. Again, we'll position ourselves in view of the tag and aim. And with faith, we'll cast Scriptura Digitalis and try to write the tag. And it looks like it worked. Let's see. We were, we had the ace. Let's try to scan the tag again and see if we got the magic numbers. There you go. Yep. Okay. There are more tags in the vicinity. This is one of the drawbacks. And that's why some of the um, other demo applications change more parameters. So if you want to restrict the power of your antenna to only detect very close by tags, you can do that. And you probably should, depending on, the, on your use case. More things you can do. Um, we've talked about setting the access password. Um, we've talked about write locking the memory. So once the tag is set and you know you don't want it to change, you can write um, and write lock it to make it read only. You probably want to do that to at least the access, uh, sorry, at least the reserved bank. Once you set the password, write lock it so it cannot be changed. You can kill a tag. Uh, that's what they do in many retail stores when you're buying something which has a tag attached to it. They are killing the tag so it won't um, sound the alarm at the exit. The way you do that is similar to all of this, but instead of instantiating a, a write access parameters, you can do that access that kill access parameters. And then on the reader, actions, that access. Right weight, and if you want to see, sorry, kill weight. If you don't want to, if you don't like synchronous APIs, you can use kill event. You'll get a notification later. Uh, the write operation, by the way, is very fast. If you saw this here, let's see. Oh, I've got all these tags lined around here. Okay. Right, so I'm going to tap right. I'm, I'm going to do it on screen so we can see it. You'll notice that it's quite fast. Less than a second. That's another advantage over our typical barcodes. Barcodes, you have to go one by one. And they're fast, but this, this works like hundreds of tags a second immediately, or essentially immediately. 
And something else, once you are more acquainted with RFID tags, something else I encourage you to start looking into is something uh, called sessions. Um, because when you're scanning a tag, how often do you want it to report back to you if you already scanned it? Uh, and there are um, standards for that. Part of the RFID protocols um, can control that. You can tell a tag to stay in, a, in an already scanned state for some time before it will start reporting back to you. So there can be some intelligence on the reader to tell you, well, I just saw a tag appear out of nowhere, or hey, I just stopped seeing a tag that was here before. That is also particularly, particularly interesting with the reader host SDK for Java or for Linux um, for fixed RFID readers. There, you can build quite a bit of intelligence onto the readers uh, themselves and then not have to worry about all the low level detail of making these calculations in your own software. The reader can already report that information back to you. Okay, and we went from zero to beginner wizard with RFID. So now it's going to pause and see if there are any questions from the audience. Okay, sorry, I was trying to unmute myself here. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Javier, is it possible to use data wedge to scan RFID and to, to simplify the process? And I can, from our, um, <clears throat> excuse me, our RFID Zebra team is on too. So let me, um, hang on one second here, folks. I'm just going to make sure that they're both, um, available to speak with. Or oh, Javier, you can take a stab at this. Oh, I'm going to say I haven't tried it, um, so I'm going to let the the more knowledgeable zero people take this one. Yeah, we're having just a little issue with this. Um... Hmm. Having just a little issue with some uh, audio here. So I tell you what we can do. Um, I can take this particular question and uh, folks, as you're ask, or typing out your questions in the Q&A chat, add your email and I can see what I can do to help you with it. Okay, we have a message from Ancan saying that data watch should work. Yeah. Okay, great, that's what I thought. That's great if you only want to do the basics, like with, when scanning a barcode, you had the code, so data which should give you that. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, William. Not a question, but this looks awesome. There you go. <laughs> it's Thank always you. good to hear. Um, and he also asked, how is the app distributed? Is it done via Google Play Store? Um, this one that I showed here is not distributed right now, but we can make it available if there's interest. Um, with the SDK comes a sample application. So if you go to wherever you got your SDK extracted, there's an SDK sample application. Um, it's similar to the one I, I showed. It just has a little bit more code. Also, um, built in into the MC3300R, and I assume other Zebra RFID devices as well, there's a, I'm not sure if we go, oh, well, let me share the screen here. Okay, so there's this um, 123 RFID application. This is by Zebra, and the source code for this is also available. So, so once you've gotten your feed wet with RFID, there's definitely interest in taking a look at how this is built and all the operations. Just be aware that this uses a lot of the more um, esoteric features, um, but it's for a good reason. Right, and just to note, um, Sean jumped in from our team there. Our 123 RFID mobile is also available on the GMS Play Store. 
for Android, and there's a similar RFID app for iOS for anybody looking for it. So thanks, Sean, for jumping in. Thank you, everybody, for your thumbs up in the question and answer <laughs> chat. That's always nice to hear. We have a lot of positive comments, so we appreciate that. If there's any other questions, I'll give it a minute here. Just wait um, I have a question. Okay, could you type it in the chat so we have a record of that? Um, in about you can the, ask here. Uh, yeah, just, okay, go ahead and ask. Okay, it's about the performing in the inventory retax in the source code in the Android. Sure. Um, first, uh, you perform inventory for read the EBC memory, uh, right? And uh, how uh, uh, wait, wait a minute. Okay, what's the delay uh, from the read uh, other memory tags uh, after they perform the inventory action read? Okay, so the question I think is how long does it take to read the memory banks? Yes, first uh, you in, uh, perform the inventory action and there are a delay for read the other bank's memory in the stack. Right. What's the delay? Um, there's no specification for that. Um, uh, it's not too much. I'm going to do that live again. And I have to kill this one because if I don't, if I don't kill one, two, three RFID because it locks the reader, I won't be able to use it. So now that I can, let me scan the tag again. And as you can see, it was relatively fast. So it took a few milliseconds, um, but not too much. You can see the timestamps here. Let me make the font bigger. So between the time we started reading and the time we printed the response, it was about a hundred and something milliseconds, taking into account that this also involves all the processing of the buffer and printing. So it's uh, it's quite fast. It's also going to depend on the size of the memory bank. So the user bank is potentially larger, so it will take longer to read. Okay, um, hang on one second. If you have questions, please post them in the question and answer box. We would prefer to read them uh, to our uh, presenters here today. One thing I didn't mention is that the okay. uh, both the 123 RFID and the RFID Android SDK itself, um, they're all free. So they're free of charge. You can go download them today and start working with them. Um, it's part of what you get for being in the Zebra ecosystem. Okay, great. Uh, another question came in. Um, is there any Flutter package available to work with the Zebra RFID? Hmm. I don't I question. Don't think there is. Um, I don't know personally, I don't know about Flutter. I think there's one for React Native. Mm -hmm. um, but if there's someone oh, there. mm -hmm. yeah, we've got a message here from Ancan saying there's no Flutter package right now. Mm -hmm. But you can see that the code is relatively easy to work with. So there's, um, if depending on how complex you want your application to be, you'll need more features. But the way to integrate them is quite straightforward. So you can potentially do that yourself if you really need to. Okay, and Javier, you might be able to answer this. Is the app available with SAP API? You know? With an SAP API? Yeah, I don't know that. Mm, I don't think there's an SAP specific linkage between the two. But 
but once you have the information in your application, you can relay it to any other SDKs that you do have. Okay, Sean jumped in here from our, our team and he said, first of all, Flutter is not supported at this time. I wasn't sure about that. Um, and the SAP API is not supported. Huh. Thanks again, Sean, for jumping in. Okay. So what we will do, just because there's been many questions about this, and I privately chatted a few and added something to the group, but in case you missed it, we are actually going to be, we're recording this presentation. So we'll post that up on the blog that we have on our developer portal, but it'll also go up on our YouTube site. Um, so you'll receive some information about that. Um, if Since you're part of this webinar and you registered, you'll receive an alert from uh, the GoToWebinar site that it'll be actually up there uh, immediately as a recording, but won't be edited. So some of our chat might be on there as long as you can ignore some of that. We're all good. Um, but we'll be uh, posting this and a hard copy of the presentation up on our developer portal. Okay, while we while we get our last few questions, I'm going to show something that we discussed briefly at the start, but we didn't go into. So when we were saying, um, connect to the reader. Okay, so here we asked the reader to send us the information of the tag whenever a tag was, uh, was found. But that means that you're going to get one callback of your um, event with notify. You're going to get one callback per tag. So instead, if you want to make your application a little bit faster, especially if you have many tags um, in the area, what you want to do is you want to instead set it to false. And you can also specify that you want to be notified of each individual tag just once per scan. But the important part here is that you don't want to get the, the data with the callback, and then you'll ask for it on your own. And let me show how to do that. So instead of this code that we have, which was for just one tag, we can have something else. Okay, so you can, instead, you can call a method to get all the tags that were read. And you're going to get a tag data, tag data array, and now you can work with that. In, in this application, what we're going to do is we're going to read all the banks for every tag that we find. But the important part is, is this one here. You can get, a, you can ask for how many you want. And then within, each of these, apart from getting the tag ID, you can do a few more interesting things. So you can get which antenna the tag was the tag was found by. You can get how many times the reader saw that. You can get exactly when. There's quite a few things here. You can get the peak RSSI. So you can, um, if you want to distinguish between a few, a few different tags and you want to know which one is closer, you can take a look at this and see which one got the highest RSSI. And that's probably the one that's closest to the reader. There's no uh, guarantee, especially if you have multiple models of tags, but it can be a, a good indicator. Okay. Um, doo -doo -doo. Oh, this is a good question. What software are you using to share the device screen? Uh, this is a nice little application called Visor. 
um, it's got a free version and a paid for version that will allow you to connect to your device through Wi-Fi without having to worry about the ADB commands and allow um, a higher quality mir mirroring. So it's uh, pretty nice. Okay, awesome. Um, and here is the last question of the day. Thank you all for your nice comments and thank yous. Um, if you have hundreds of RFIDs near, how do I control which ones I would read and how do I prevent it from reading more than once? Ah, that's what I was talking about with the inventory sessions. So um, you cannot really prevent the reader from reading everything it finds. Um, well, you, you can, but within reason. So you can tell the, the reader to use um, less power. So any tags that are close by will still be detected, but any tags that are farther away will not be detected. Um, if you know which tags you are interested in locating, uh, you can set a pre-filter so you can tell the reader to scan only for specific tags. Um, you can ask to receive fewer. Um, so here I asked for 100. If you only want to 20, you can do that. Um, I cannot say right now what's the criteria for resolving this. Um, maybe someone from, from Siever can clarify this. So if I ask for fewer than were read, which ones is it going to give me? A pre-filter can reduce the EPCs where you can restrict by an EPC bitwise mask. That's from Sean. Um, I have one other question here regarding pricing. Okay. Give me just a moment here to track this. The 123 RFID mobile and the SDKs are free of charge because we've had a couple of questions on that. Right. And the tags themselves, uh, they're very affordable, especially the passive tags. Um, mm -hmm. They're just a few cents each nowadays. Okay, one last Technical question, can we integrate ang integrate Angular or React? Yes, um, but not directly. So you can integrate them if you're running something like um, Cordova or PhoneGap, where you can create your own plugin for this. Um, you could create a, a plugin, and there might be one available already. Um, I know there's one for React Native or there at least there used to be one for React Native. Okay. And we got one more question. Hi, um, which link profile is best for tag reading? Which link profile? Mm -hmm. hmm. I'm not sure about that. I don't know. I'm going to let that one for someone from SIBA. Yeah, we may need some clarification on that. Um, and then I just got another one. What is the maximum number of tags that you can read? Mm. There's a physical limitation. So with any physical medium, there's going to be a limitation for how many um, items or tags you can have broadcasting at a time in a single place. I don't know what the limit is. Uh, I know it's high, um, but that's also where this... Um, session control and inventory session comes into play yeah. because um, even if there are multiple um if even if there's a high number of tags the reader can tell a tag well i want to read you and once i've read you i don't need you to report back to me again until i i go away and ask again so it will uh, the reader will, will start scanning whatever it can first then those tags will get quiet and free up the, the airwaves for other tags to be able to respond. Okay, the link profile, uh, Sean responded to our last question. Thank you, Javier. Um, the link profile is seen in the 123 RFID and pre, there are presets. So, all right. Um, I, and he also said, once you set, you can look at, look in the advanced menus to see what each set the RFID are, 
what's what each set the RFID reader is to. I'm sorry, I'm I'm just hanging here for one second just to see if there's anything else. Thank you again for all your nice comments. Well, what we'll do is we'll, um, uh, as a reminder, because we've had a couple of questions on this again, we will be recording this presentation. We will have a hard copy of the presentation, post it on our blog post on the developer portal. Um, if there's any outstanding questions or anything that comes to mind maybe after the presentation, I highly encourage you to email us at developer at zebra.com and we can have one of our team members here or Zebra team members respond to you. And I think with that, we'll, it's a wrap. So Javier, thank you so much for this presentation. My pleasure. It was excellent. And um, we're wishing everyone well and a wonderful day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Sean, thanks for jumping in. Appreciate everyone here. Have a have a wonderful day, everybody.